So with that, allow me to now introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Shira Khan, who is an historian of education, who has kindly agreed to share some of the insights from her own research with us today. Um, Dr. Khan finished her doctorate in history and Hebrew and Judaic studies at NYU in 2013, while also working as an academic dean at the Jewish Theological Seminary. She later became the inaugural uh, Talbi Koret Early Career Scholar at the Center for Jewish History and has worked um, as a um, instructor in the New York City area. Um, she has been a member of the history faculty at the Dalton School since 2017, which is an independent school in New York City. She is the co-editor of A Jewish Feminine Mystique, Jewish Women in Postwar America, which was published in 2010. And she's currently working on a new book entitled Pledging Allegiance, Jewish Sororities and Civil Rights in Cold War America. And I think she'll be drawing on that research for her talk today. I also wanted to note that she, there's a wonderful podcast called Gatekeepers, um, uh, which is focused on the history of Ivy League schools in relationship to Jews and Jewish admissions and other issues. Um, and she spoke in episode seven of that podcast on topics that relate to Penn in particular. So we're gonna include a link to that podcast um, in case you're interested. So without further ado, let me now turn things over to Dr. Khan. Welcome. Thank you so much, Steve, for the warm welcome. And thank you to Ann Albert and Diana Dennis Walters, Josh Shaplitsky, the CAT Center, and the co-sponsors to today's talk. I really appreciate the invitation and to share the experience of 20th century Jewish sorority women with you. Um, so hopefully you're able to see the presentation. Um, and I really am hoping that by the time we um, end today, that you can see how the Jewish sororities really offer us a window into thinking about the social impacts of anti-Semitism across several decades of the 20th century, and really how in turn um, Jewish sorority women, both those on the college campus, alumni members of these groups, really used the Greek system and their experience in it to carve out really a unique identity for themselves. One that was very much um, trying to adhere to white middle-class um, behavioral norms while also preserving distinct aspects of their Jewish identities. So um, in our time together, I'd love to think about the following topics. One, a primer on the origin stories of these groups, who they are, why they formed, and where is their place within this larger thing called the American Greek system. Um, I then want to take us through um, figuring out how Jewish sorority women, especially those who are operating on the national level with other national sororities and fraternities, Jewish and non-Jewish, how they tried to navigate their experiences and articulate concerns coming from the American Jewish community. I then, of course, want to look at the impact of anti-Semitism on these women's groups, where they encountered it, how they encountered it, and of course, how they responded to um, what they saw as manifestations of anti-Semitism in different facets of American higher education. Um, and finally, I would love to take you into the lives of Jewish sorority girls. What did daily life in a Jewish sorority in the first six decades or so of the 20th century look like? What were they doing? Who were they doing that with? Um, and what does this tell us about campus life for young Jewish people, certainly then and perhaps even today? So um, I should probably introduce you to the four main players of our story for today. And these are the four national Jewish women's organizations, all founded in the first two decades of the 20th century that I have conducted most of my research on. Um, so as you'll see here, each of these sororities, and I'll explain a little bit more about these two columns in a minute, um, they are all known as historically Jewish groups, meaning from their inception in the first couple of decades of the 20th century through certainly the 1960s, if not today. They were founded primarily for Jewish women, had almost exclusively Jewish membership, and saw and spoke about themselves as Jewish women's organizations. Um, so you'll see on the left-hand column, we have two sororities, which until today still identify as historically Jewish. Alpha Epsilon Phi, which is also called AE Phi, which is often how I'll refer to them, Sigma Delta Ta or SDT. And then you also have two non-sectarian sororities on the right. These were both founded as non-sectarian groups, which I'll discuss more in a few minutes. 
Um, you have Delta Phi Epsilon, D Phi E, and Phi Sigma Sigma, or Phi Sig. These are also still very much in operation today. Um, were historically um, Jewish, even though they were non-sectarian in mission, and are still today operating as non-sectarian sororities. And it should be noted that all of these sororities, um, certainly in the 21st century, have Jewish and non-Jewish members in various chapters of their organizations. So before even these Jewish stories get onto the scene, a word about the larger Greek system. Some of you may know that Greek letter societies are a very American invention. And in fact, they have the same birth year as the nation itself. 1776, we see the establishment of Phi Beta Kappa. At that time, it was more of an honorary literary society. But even by the 1820s, we are talking about the proliferation of men's fraternities. These are not Jewish groups. Um, they are in colleges throughout the northeastern, midwestern, and southern parts of the United States. And pretty soon into their founding, they become a bit more social in nature than perhaps academic, as many of them were founded to be. Um, and it should be no surprise then that especially after the Civil War at mid-century, um, women's groups are founded, um, often at the very same campuses that men's fraternities are already in operation. Um, certainly in the decades where women are first coming to the college campus in the United States, sororities like fraternities offer um, not just camaraderie, but certainly housing in some places and other um, eating locations, practical aspects of how to get through college life. Um, and so with this in mind, it's perhaps not surprising that by the 1890s, when we are talking about the first um, you know, generation of um, American-born um, Jewish children coming out of parents who maybe migrated either earlier in the 19th century as part of the early decades of the age of mass migration, they are beginning to come to college campuses too, and they would like to experience what they see their non-Jewish peers doing. Um, so the first Jewish fraternity is Zeta Beta Ta. They were founded in 1898 at Columbia University. Um, and they chose, again, Greek letters for their names. Um, ZBT was meant to stand for Zion, beat, beat, sorry, Zion, um, or Zion, Beit Mishpat, Tipade, which means um, Zion will be redeemed with justice. Um, and again, they operated um, in a social vein very much as their non-Jewish peers at Columbia and other campuses were doing. And they were soon joined on the Greek landscape by many other Jewish groups in um, the tens. Um, I should also note before getting into the history of these four Jewish sororities that are going to occupy our time, there are, of course, other Jewish sororities. The one um, that might be interesting to know about was the first really founded, which was in 1903 at what was then called Normal College. Today, it's called Hunter College here in New York City. Um, they called themselves Iota Alpha Pi as a group. Um, as you may know, there's really no great translation for the letter iota in um, the English alphabet. So rather than calling themselves the IOPS um, in terms of nicknames, they somehow, according to urban legend, called themselves the Japs in no relation to the stereotype of the Jewish American princess um, that comes about as more of a post-World War II invention. Um, but interesting to note that iota alpha pi was really the first sortie to distinguish itself as a Jewish group in 1903. And they really only confined their chapters to various Northeastern um, college campuses and did not become a national phenomenon the way in which these four groups were. So to just give you a sense as to why these Jewish sororities and non-sectarian historically Jewish sororities were founded in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. The first we have to talk about is Alpha Epsilon Phi. It is the oldest still in existence and it was founded as you see in 1909 at Barnard College. Now in New York City at the time, there were non-Jewish sororities operating at Barnard, which was a women's college. Columbia University was across the street and housed many fraternities. Um, and so Helen Phillips, the woman whose words you see on the screen today, she was a Jewish Barnard student who was living in the dorms at the time. And she had a small group of friends, um, all of whom were Jewish on campus. They often commuted from their homes in and around Manhattan. And she was lonely. And she really wanted to have a social sort of camaraderie experience that she saw non-Jewish women having in sororities. 
And so she invited her friends to her dorm room one night in October of 1909, and together they decided to form a Jewish Greek society, Alpha Epsilon Phi. And as you see, the purpose was really to bind them together and weave closer the ties of strong friendship that they were developing. So really for social reasons, there was nothing explicit um, in their mission about a Jewish sorority at this moment in that they were Jewish and they were friends and that's what the meaning was to them. And they were founded again because for a few of the women, they could not get into the existing non-Jewish houses on the college campus and they really wanted something all their own. We can then look to the first example of a non-sectarian historically Jewish sorority. And this is in Phi Sigma Sigma at Hunter College in 1913. So Phi Sigma Sigma, when it was formed, there was a lot of interesting, um, again, like urban lore, if you will, around their founding. Um, and this is from a quote of um, an early member of the sorority and their publication, The Sphinx. And it says that a lot has been said about the non-sectarianism of this charter group, meaning the first group that was founded at Hunter College. And it is, of course, true that it was in a small degree non-Jewish, but the important thing to remember is the non-sectarianism of its ideals. So when it came to Phi Sigma Sigma, there were non-Jewish sororities and Alpha Epsilon Phi operating on the Hunter campus at the time. Iota Alpha Pi was also there. And they decided that rather than try to pursue getting into non-Jewish houses, or perhaps they did not have great relationships with the existing Jewish ones, they wanted to be non-sectarian, meaning that they were open to anyone regardless of religious affiliation. And that did seem to be the case perhaps for a couple of the founders of Phi Sig. However, very early on in their existence, they really identified as a Jewish sorority. And when it came to the, the um, broader discourse within the Greek system about like who were the Jewish houses or who were the Jewish sororities, Phi Sigma Sigma was always listed among them again through the 1960s. The other two to our story are going to both be founded in 1917. One, and this is the only one not to be in New York City, is um, Sigma Delta Tau, founded at Cornell University. This is a picture of Grace Serenko Grossman, one of the founders of SDT. And I think what's really interesting about Grace is that after graduation, she actually ended up moving to Philadelphia. And she became the founder of the University of Penn chapter, the beta chapter of Sigma Delta Tau. Um, and Penn, interestingly, is really one of the only Ivies that certainly boasted a sorority system, Jewish and non, um, during the 20th century. Um, some of the other Ivies at times had fraternity systems. Certainly other Ivies have eating clubs or supper clubs or other you know, secret societies. Um, but Penn is pretty unique in the sense that it had a robust Greek life that looked like public and private colleges across the United States, while also being part of the Ivy League. Um, so Grace Grossman, while she was at Cornell, was known as the campus queen, according to yearbooks and publications, um, and really found enough meaning in her own experience at Cornell to bring her sorority to Philadelphia once she got there and form a group of collegiate women to extend Sigma Delta Tau elsewhere. The fourth of the historically Jewish sororities is Delta Phi Epsilon. It was founded in 1917 um, at New York University Law School, um, which was separate from the other arts and science campus at the time. And they, like Phi Sigma Sigma, decided that they did not want to be a Jewish group, a Jewish sorority, even though the five founders were all Jewish um, in identity. And they too wanted to be non-sectarian, to be rather than to seem to be, and really make a point of demonstrating that they were open to any woman they deemed worthy of membership, regardless of her background. Um, whether or not the non-sectarian sororities, just like the non-sectarian fraternities, were doing this purely out of wanting to be open um, social societies, or if they were also maybe doing this as a soft rebuke to the um, religion that really dominated um, Greek life at this time, a predominantly Protestant organizations, um, we don't totally know. But it's interesting to keep in mind some of the motivations here. 
So the thing to know um, about sororities is that the Jewish sororities, whether they were historically Jewish, non-sectarian, um, they all follow the same structure um, in that every sorority will have a national office staffed by alumni volunteers. So women who went through the sorority are alumni and who are donating their time. And when I say time, I mean a lot of time um, visiting different chapters of their groups, organizing with national um you know, parties, um, advocating for their groups, managing these alumni volunteers, which is in this middle band over here that you see. And then at the bottom, you see all the different chapters. So the alpha chapter, the first chapter of the sorority that's formed, as I just mentioned with Gross, Serenko, Grossman, when you find the second chapter of the sorority become beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and so on in the alphabet. And so this is going to be the structure of all sororities, and Jewish groups are not different than other um, existing Christian sororities. And again, they're mostly um, Christian either by declaration or by membership at this time, although, of course, there's always going to be exceptions on the local level. Um, so as we move through today, the two places I would say to really keep an eye on are certainly the chapters themselves. What are Jewish women on the college campus doing, these younger members? But also what is happening within that older generation of alumni volunteers who are spending years, if not decades of their lives, giving back to these Jewish women's organizations? While they're also managing perhaps families, volunteer work in um, National Council of Jewish Women, Hadassah, their synagogues, civic groups, um, political groups, and other commitments in their lives. Many of them are also um, pretty early on, as we even saw in the New York University Law School example, working women um, trying to have or do it all while also honoring some of what they see as their sorority commitments. So to really demonstrate that the Jewish sororities have quote unquote made it in America, their goal is to become part of the national Greek system. The Greek system is divided into men and women's groups. So on the left, we have the men's group, the North American Interfraternity Conference, founded in 1909. And so it's umbrella organization to all recognized national fraternities. And it should be noted that the first Jewish member, Zeta Beta Ta, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, it applied in 1912 for membership. It was accepted. The other Jewish and historically Jewish non-sectarian fraternities also apply when they are ready, when they meet the number of chapters they need to have in a certain number of states in the United States. There's a member vote. They're accepted. This doesn't mean to to suggest that everything is always fantastic and cheery between the various members of um, the North American Interfraternity Conference, but um, membership itself does not really seem to be an issue for the men. Now we move over to the women. The National Panhellenic Conference is founded in 1902, so a bit earlier than the men's group, also serves as an umbrella organization to all national sororities. Um, interestingly, as you will see in that little cloud, um, AE5 applies for the first time in 1917 when they meet according to NPC or the National Panel and Conference's guidelines of, again, the certain number of chapters, um, certain number of members. In 1917, as we're about to see, they will be rejected. They are going to apply basically every year between 1917 and 1947 for membership into the NPC. It is in 1947 that AE Phi, SDT, D Phi, and Phi Sig are all accepted into the NPC under a new category of membership created just for them and the one Catholic sorority that is accepted at this time. And they are accepted as full members in 1951 into the NPC. And they have remained full members ever since that time. So there's something going on there between the men's groups and the women's groups that we really see almost a 30-year discrepancy in when the Jewish women are admitted versus the Jewish men, which we'll delve into in a moment. Um, we should also note that going into 1917, the year that Alpha Epsilon Phi applies for membership, um, a couple of years before, the NPC says the following about their motto. They say that the NPC, their goal, is good college citizenship as preparation for good citizenship in the larger world of alumni days, in the ideal that shall guide our chapter activities. So again, the idea that fraternities and sororities, and certainly for these sororities, they are trying to produce good female American citizens. We have to ask, what does a good American citizen look like, according to women at the NPC, who are these elite 
um, relatively wealthy, because again, sororities cost money to be members and cost money to be alumni, volunteers in. Um, what does it mean to be a white American, mostly Christian sorority woman at this time? And to what extent is there room for minorities, especially religious minorities within their ranks? So let's go to 1917. So on the right, you will see minutes from the conference of the NPC in which they are debating AE5's membership. Um, and you will see the following, that um, again, these minutes are refreshing and that this is a closed door conversation and these women trust each other enough on some level to speak their minds and figure out, are they aligned when it comes to the topic of whether or not they should accept a Jewish sorority into their ranks? So a few snippets from the conversation on the right, the first member, um, says, quote, the Jew will never be an American. He only has a technical citizenship. He gets all the benefits, yet he maintains a race separate and distinct in our nation. Now, the speaker of this quote is someone who in, I would say my broader study tends to be an antagonist for the um, um, Jewish sororities. Her name is Ms. Collins from the Chi Omega sorority. She is really impressive. She is a trained attorney. She spends about four decades of her life as um, a very involved leader within both the sorority and also the NPC. So she is there for the duration of the Jewish sorority um, attempts to get into their membership. Um, and so again, the idea that the Jew will not be a citizen, there is technical citizenship, right? So legally, um, most Jews, when they arrived in the United States, were categorized according to American racial definitions as white. Um, so they were able to apply for citizenship, right, after a certain number of years of being in the country. That is not contested. But there's, there's another kind of citizenship, right, suggested here that the Jews don't seem to be able to convey or represent. They're taking the benefits of the being legal citizens, yet they are self-segregating, right? They're not quite American in the way that maybe other people, especially those in the Greek system, are. Another member, they claim to be non-sectarian, and they're discussing Alpha Epsilon Phi, um, which are not necessarily non-sectarian, though they say they're open to everyone. Conclusive evidence has been brought before us that they are a strictly sectarian sorority. They are preponderantly, if not entirely, Jewish. Now, this is correct. They are almost entirely Jewish. But again, there's something slightly subversive sounding about this. Like, are they lying to us about who their membership is? Why might they be misrepresenting themselves? And again, we have to remember that a lot, if not almost all, as we will see, of these sororities um, have what I believe Jessica Cooper called invisible sectarianism. They are mostly Protestant groups accepting only Protestant women even though they might see themselves as non-sectarian in practice, but they very much see Alpha Epsilon Phi's presentation of themselves as being non-sectarian, um, really misleading and problematic for being misleading. And of course, we have the final quote about being very sorry to see the group accepted. Um, and indeed, this was um, the broader sentiment of the group and um, they are not accepted into the NPC. As I mentioned, Alpha Epsilon Phi will start applying almost every year. Um, and it got to the point that in 1925, the National Panhellenic Conference at their annual meeting decided to send a survey to its membership. Um, and these are the two questions that this part of the survey asks. One, does your constitution um, limit race and religious beliefs? And two, if your constitution does not limit it in writing, is there an unwritten rule that applies? Is there, if you will, like a gentleman's or gentlewoman's agreement here that you will just really not take minority members? And you will see that the members, um, you know, revealed their um, constitutional language. You do not see a lot of sororities that have formal language in their constitutions. Um, three of them, in fact, have um, limits on membership. And usually it means um, that they're limited to the Christian faith. We see one interesting sorority here limited to, quote, the Caucasian race and the Christian faith, right? So making sure that only white women and Christian women are um, enabled to get in. And we also have a really interesting example of um, Alpha Delta Pi, which says excluding Jewesses and Mormons, um, except by a special dispensation, which has been granted in a few cases. So again, aware of some of the issues around exclusion, um, but still feeling able to practice them. 
Um, so we only have three houses that do this. Most of them say we are not actually limiting in our written documents as an organization. Then for the unwritten rules, you only have a few more sororities here that have unwritten rules. Um, so again, limiting to the white race and excluding Jews. Um, another one, um, Gamma Phi Beta, national agreement excluding Jews. So in some cases, it was very clear that there was anti-Semitism embedded in either the written documents or in informal languages. This also, though, doesn't mean that just because there was nothing on the national level in writing or even as a gentleman's agreement, this wasn't being practiced on various college campuses. But certainly that in the 1920s, the members of the National Panhellenic Conference thought that one, there was enough of desire by some of these Jewish houses to try to get membership into the NPC. They really wanted to understand where those Christian women's organizations that were in fact the members of the NPC, how they felt about this issue and if they were aligned enough to really hold their defensive line about not having Jews in. Because it was really important that the comfort level of all accepted members of the NPC be honored. So if there are seven members out of 23 who have some language about excluding Jewish women, how can these members be comfortable if they start admitting Jewish groups in? And as we just saw, is it really going to be just Alpha Epsilon Phi? Are other groups then going to come in? These were real questions for um, the non-Jewish sorority women and questions that they did not in the 1920s want to really grapple with. So we have a response of a Jewish sorority woman in Alpha Epsilon Phi appealing the rejection in 1923. And she says, we have never resented the almost complete exclusion of Jewish students from other sororities. We believe that the majority of chapters leave out Jewesses for the same reasons that they leave out scores of non-Jewish students. And this is important, that they would not contribute to the social homogeneity of the group. NPC is the recognized body and its stamp of approval is very vital to a young sorority. Without it, our life and usefulness and our peace of mind on many campuses is menaced. So here we really see the impact of the NPC's anti-Semitism on the Jewish sororities. And that the Jewish sororities are not actually asking for Jewish women to be included in Jewish, uh, sorry, in Christian or non-Jewish houses on local college campuses, right? They, as Jewish organizations, have a vested interest in maintaining themselves, their livelihoods through getting Jewish members. So they believe in some ways in a form of self-segregation. We will have the Jewish women. We are just asking to have a seat at the governing table. We want the prestige that only the National Panhellenic Conference can offer. So we are not threatening you. We are not overtaking you. We're not asking you to change the composition of your local memberships even. We really just want to have a seat and be legitimized as being equal to, on the national level, um, non-Jewish sororities. Now, this fell on some sympathetic ears over the decades, and you're going to see appeals like this again almost annually, mostly from Alpha Epsilon Phi, who emerges as the spokesperson or the spokesgroup of the Jewish and non-sectarian Jewish sororities. Um, but again, it's not until after World War II that we're going to start seeing a change. And this is an issue that in some ways certainly makes it into the broader American Jewish community. So we see here in 1950, um, just one of many examples in the Jewish American press, wondering what is going on that the Jewish sororities, unlike the fraternities, they can't get into this national Panhellenic group. So we see in this op-ed, um, the author saying, quote, not that global well-being hangs on it, um, and indeed, this is in 1950. Um, but this corner has long wondered why national collegiate Jewish sororities have never been admitted to the Panhellenic Council, the national body representing all college sororities. This discrimination against Jewish women on our university campus is one of the quieter abominations in our American social pattern. We're curious to know whether anything has ever been done to cure the evil. And if not, why in heaven's name not? And I think this is really important, especially this line about quieter abominations. Um, when we're talking about forms or manifestations of anti-Semitism, um, in American Jewish campus life in the first six decades of um, 
you know, the 20th century, certainly college admissions, as, you know, Ari Kalman mentioned last week, as Jerome Carabao will mention, I believe, next week when he speaks. Um, quotas against Jewish students are real. They are in force from the 1920s going into the post-war period. Um, this is a really harmful form of social anti-Semitism. It affects where people go to college, sometimes what professions they enter based on professional schools and the quotas that they have. Um, so this is not to discount the power that social anti-Semitism can have, especially in this example on college women who are already feeling like minorities, both due to their Jewishness and also being women on college campuses. Um, and certainly this is becoming more common in the post-World War II era, where women are entering colleges in higher numbers than then before, um, but certainly not in the first couple of decades of the 20th century when really the Jewish sororities emerge as one of the only places um, that Jewish women can really find um, very organized camaraderie on college campuses throughout the country. Um, and I jump ahead just for a moment until the 1980s to sort of ask the question about like, what changes over time, even once Jewish sororities after 1947, after 1951, are able to get into the National Panhellenic Conference? So this is a quote from a member um, of a Jewish sorority who was one of the delegates to the NPC. Um, and she says, walking into a meeting um, with these mostly non-Jewish women, and again, this is three decades, a generation after formal acceptance happens. Did you ever get the feeling that maybe you shouldn't be there and so you don't walk over there? I heard one of the women saying something about Jews, and I don't like it when you use that word. You say someone is Jewish. The woman then said, I never thought I'd have to sit down at a table with them, let alone the same room as them. We were not really part of the group. And so this tells us again that even when formal acceptance um, even when that admission comes through, that doesn't mean that there is real clear tolerance and certainly cooperation um, between Jewish and non-Jewish women, certainly at the National Panhellenic Conference, which is a relatively um, small C conservative politically leading group throughout um, the 20th century. And this very much impacts the way in which the Jewish women feel about themselves. Um, and then also how they start feeling about their members and the pressure they feel to demonstrate what the sort of like the pinnacle of what American Jewishness and American Jewish femininity might be in ways that they feel are compatible with the norms that these other non-Jewish National Panhellenic Conference delegates expect. So let's turn now to looking at how the Jewish sororities responded to these manifestations of social anti-Semitism. Um, there's sort of like two broad categories, I would argue, um, if you're looking at Jewish women's behaviors, um, really in the pre and post World War II era when it came to Jewish sororities. Um, the first is going to be the Jewish sorority women, like all sororities, but I would argue sometimes at an even higher degree, pleased their members' appearances and behaviors. Um, they believed that they were only as strong in the public eye as their weakest member. And so ensuring that every member upheld certain beauty ideals, um, certain behaviors, it was essential to them getting into local chapters of the sorority and behaving themselves as alumni. So over here on the left, you'll see an example of an internal report from the Alpha Epsilon Phi sorority about a group of women who were trying to pledge them in the 1930s at the University of Iowa. And it went everywhere from passable appearance um, you know, good extracurricular activities, but they were also really worried about women who are quote, like Rushy too, flippant, loud, extremely Semitic actions, which usually meant, as Mary Ann Sanua has told us, using their hands a lot, seeming vulgar. Um, also, it's interesting to note that Rushi number four, a veritable, quote, mess. They called her good DeFi E material, speaking again to some of the tensions even within the Jewish Greek system about how other Jewish sororities tended to see one another and compete with one another over members. The idea that one woman was not good enough to be in AE5, perhaps she was good enough to be in DeFi E at the time. Um, and it should be noted that on any college campus, um, in reality, there was some perception around sorority rankings 
they weren't always accurate. And just because one sorority was quote unquote the best at one campus um, didn't mean that they were the best at another. But it's certainly ideas that a lot of Jewish sorority women believed in. Now, on one hand, there's going to be, as we'll see, policing of members' appearances and behaviors, but also the Jewish women tried whenever possible, especially on the national level of governments within the NPC, to demonstrate that they were okay with their liberal-leaning Jewish politics being a bit at odds with those of the non-Jewish women. Um, so as one of many examples of this, you can see that in 1955, um, the Delta Phi Epsilon sorority, D Phi E, decided to give their quote unquote person of the year award to the gentleman standing in the middle, Edward R. Murrow, who was sort of fresh off of his anti Joseph McCarthy um, broadcast, who was really seen as a beacon of anti, um, you know, anti-communist hysteria, really pushing back against that. Um, and so they felt comfortable enough with their own internal politics as a Jewish group um, to sort of say that maybe not every sorority member or not every group within the NPC would champion Edward R. Murrow. Um, in fact, they sometimes champion the tactics of McCarthy and some of the people working with him in the broader NPC group. And they wanted to sort of like push back against that and feel comfortable enough in their place to do so. The other thing that was really important to Jewish fraternities and sororities that should be mentioned is also that they were very invested in endogamy. So the idea that their members would keep Jewishness within dating and marriages within ideally the Jewish Greek system. And so just as two quick examples, on the left, you can see a Jewish fraternity. It's actually a non-sectarian fraternity, Phi Epsilon Pi, which was broadly Jewish. For their convention, they always brought Jewish girls as their dates and often coming from local chapters of Jewish sororities. And we'll see on the right that Jewish sororities are doing the exact same thing. Um, and then in 1951, the Jewish alumni asked their college members um, what they were interested in seeing in their dates for convention. And again, all of these men would have been chosen from local chapters of Jewish and non-sectarian Jewish fraternities um, to be dates. So moving into the lived experience of um, the collegiate chapters of these Jewish sororities. And again, keeping note that if you were to summarize the Jewish collegiate experience in a nutshell throughout the 20th century, you're talking about Jewish groups who look like everyone else, who sometimes do things Jewishly. And we'll talk about what that really means. So here are some examples of how Jewish women described why they wanted to join a Jewish sorority. It was everything from, I was looking for a family, um, coming from a Jewish family and the sorority provided me a family. Um, the idea that um, if you were Jewish, you were not able to join a non-Jewish house. So the bubble on the mid right, if you were Jewish, you were cut from the big houses on campus, meaning the non-Jewish houses on campus parental pressure. Um, my mom felt that if I was part of a sorority, I'd meet people and help me meet a man. Very important, again, speaking to endogamy and Jewish sororities. Um, and so there are several different reasons why a woman might have found herself in a Jewish sorority. But over and over again, in oral histories conducted with former members of Jewish groups across the country, public, private universities, different regions, different decades. The idea of a Jewish sorority as a family at a time when they needed it, um, the idea that there was anti-Semitism on campus and they were not able to join the larger Greek system, and the idea that their families were often really happy and supportive about it came up over and over again. One of the best ways to find out about Jewish sorority life, college yearbooks. Um, for example, here in this 1950 yearbook from the University of Texas, you can see that the membership of the Delta Phi Epsilon and Sigma Delta Tau um, chapters um, were almost exclusively, if not exclusively, Jewish. But there is absolutely nothing other than perhaps their names or, you know, you could argue the dearth of blondes um, that actually distinguish them as Jewish houses. There are no Jewish symbols on their pages. None of the women is wearing anything that is identifiably Jewish. It's really the fact that they came together as Jewish women um, to, at least in the case of the University of Texas, live together in these houses, in these residences. So it's really in the social lives that we see the Jewishness of these groups come through on the local college campuses. 
Um, we can see here on the left, so Phi Sig at the University of Miami, they're into beauty pageants. They promote the beauty of some of their members. And interestingly, Christmas, as you'll see in both of these examples, often comes up as a time in which philanthropy happens because the Jewish groups probably don't have a lot of other social commitments on Christmas. And so they use that event to actually give back to the broader community and demonstrate their good Americanism by raising money or volunteering their time for broader causes like volunteering at a children's hospital, like donating the proceeds from a show to a local charity. Um, interestingly, they will also, as you'll see, is the example on the right, um, that the DFIE chapter at The Ohio State University in the middle of the Korean War held an ROTC costume party. So again, demonstrating their patriotism and pairing with TEP, a non-sectarian yet historically Jewish fraternity um, in their socializing. Here we see a list of the Alpha Epsilon Phi sorority coming from the 1950s and all the different types of social and philanthropic events that they had. We see them partnering with Hillel, the Hillel Foundation on campus. We see yet again, Christmas murals being painted. Um, winter resorts trips. So again, speaking to the elitism and the class status of most women who enter a Jewish sorority and how it is something that not every Jewish woman on campus can afford. Um, thinking about the fun that they have with things like in Texas, the heaven and hell party, fairy tale parties, and perhaps my favorite, we do get into academics. Um, at the bottom, at the University of Illinois, we see that they have a steak and beans dinner and that the two classes, so freshman, junior, sophomore, senior, um, the two different levels that have the highest academics overall get steak for dinner and the two lowest get beans. Um, so all different types of social um, commitments, social opportunities that the Jewish sororities really offer their members. So this is really going for the first six decades of um, the sorority existence, we see anti-Semitism, we see ways in which Jewish, especially students, just try to live their lives with the acknowledgement that anti-Semitism exists on the college campus and beyond. Things are going to start changing in the late 1960s. And I would just, and I'm happy to answer questions about this, what we're really seeing by the late 1960s is a change in American society and one that is certainly impacting both the Jewish sororities and also the larger Greek system. With the rise of ethnic consciousness, the counterculture, um, the entire Greek system, including Jewish fraternities and sororities, are starting to be seen as relatively antiquated, um, old school elite, not representative of directions in which American youth want to go in. And so the entire Greek system is going to start experiencing losses in membership. And with these losses, especially considering in the Midwest and the South, where they have these huge residences that they need to fill, um, some of the restrictive measures start getting eased a little bit when it comes to membership because they need people to literally be in their homes. Um, and so we start looking at a new era of the Greek system, but also how the Jewish fraternities and sororities start positioning themselves as either continually Jewish, but maybe more open to people of other backgrounds, or decide to really move away from their Jewish roots a lot, um, a bit more explicitly and really try to embrace their non-sectarianism upon which they were founded. Um, so again, just Betty Sparrow, the president of Delta Phi Epsilon in 1967, nodding to some of these troubles. So just to conclude, um, it's important to note that exclusion in the Greek system gave rise to Jewish sororities. Anti-Semitism was real. It was rampant. Jewish women felt it and they felt the need to respond and their best response would be to be finding societies of their own rather than continuously always pushing for membership within the non-existing Greek houses. Um, we saw that alumni experienced expressions of anti-Semitism at these national Panhellenic meetings for decades before and after their admission in 1947. And this really shaped the ways in which they thought about Jewishness, the vulnerability of both themselves and their collegiate charges, and how then they put pressure on everyone to appear a certain way and perhaps behave in others. Um, and then anti-Semitism, again, impacted daily life in college sororities, but the younger generation, while they were on college campuses, often felt empowered to express their identities as they saw fit as Jewish Greek collegians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shira.
Um, <clears throat> I'll just introduce myself really quickly. I'm Ann Albert. I'm the Clatt Family Director for Public Programs here at the CAT Center, here to moderate some Q&A. We do have a number of questions already submitted, so I'm going to do my very best to, to move us through a conversation about a bunch of aspects of, of what we just heard from you. Um, I think the biggest question that's coming through is maybe like the million dollar question of um, why it is, if you can offer any explanation, that the Panhellenic Conference, so the National Sorority Group, resisted Jewish participation so much longer than the men's national group, right? I think you really elucidated for us the reasons on the part of the leadership of this group, but why was it different for the men? Great question. Thank you. Um, so a lot of the reason I would argue that there was like this gender difference of several decades of acceptance is that men had abilities to encounter one another and work cooperatively in different sectors of their lives. I'm thinking especially in occupations and the military, especially as we get into the post-World War I era. Um, and so, again, I don't suggest in any way that um, members, um, you know, in the men's umbrella organization that non-Jewish and Jewish men were meeting for dinner after meetings and having like wonderful warm collegial conversations. Um, a lot of Jewish fraternity records um, suggest otherwise and that it was still very much like a bit segregated or secluded based on their Jewishness. Um, but they were able to at least organizationally work together with a degree of tolerance. And that's really because a lot of men like saw men from other backgrounds in various parts of their lives and didn't feel that that was compromising their own social dynamics um, and that they could just sort of, again, like work together and then go home to whatever their own communities were. Um, and I would argue women did not really have a lot of those same opportunities, especially in the pre-World War II decades, um, particularly if you're looking at middle and upper class women. Um, a lot of these women did not work, so they were very involved in their neighborhoods, many of which could be segregated at the time. They were often involved in their church. Well, Jewish women are not going to their church to get involved. They're usually right involved in synagogue work or other things. Um, so the points of contact were really fewer. Women were not involved in the military, um, even during World War II in significant ways, right? Like, yes, many women joined, um, you know, auxiliary units in World War II, but it wasn't the same type of contact that would then transition into the sorority world. And we have to also remember that certainly for the first half of the 20th century, um, women writ large, regardless of religion or ethnicity, um, were feeling like minorities on the college campus and certainly felt policing by men of their behaviors. So I would argue that like a lot of the resistance to accepting Jewish women, and again, the Catholic sorority as well, um, was that women writ large, especially these elite women of the NPC, they already felt vulnerable being women. And they did not want women they questioned as being sort of like wholly American, dragging themselves down if they couldn't comport themselves according to like white middle class standards. Thank you. That's really helpful and really um, illuminating to think about the ways in which experience of social exclusion or anti-Semitism was really different based on your gender, but also your class. Um, I think following up on that, there are some questions also about participation in other forms of campus extracurriculars. So were women, or if you want to talk about also Jewish men, were they also experiencing exclusion um, from other kinds of clubs or activities or opportunities? Were they creating like Jewish centered clubs besides the Greek world? How did that, what was the experience of a Jewish woman on campus in say the thirties or the fifties? Sure. I would say that like in many ways, what I found from looking at about 12 different college campuses um, across the country is that it varied. Um, one thing I would say that when it came to publications like the yearbook, the student newspaper, um, there seemed to be no barrier to full Jewish inclusion, including being editors of chiefs of various publications. So I didn't see very clear examples of social anti-Semitism really manifesting there. Um, and I would say that like, um, honor societies, again, because they were really based purely on GPA, that was also not a place in which Jews would necessarily see some kind of barrier to their admission. Um, it was really on college campuses where Greek life dominated. I would say the other place that I really saw this happening, interestingly, is the homecoming court. If your university had homecoming king and queen, um, Jewish members could serve on the homecoming committee who selected the king and queen. Um, 
I saw, I think, one example in like five decades of certain universities, including state universities, private universities, in which there was any Jewish man or woman, and it was a woman, um, who was actually named homecoming queen up through the early 1960s. This doesn't mean that it didn't happen at other campuses, um, but certainly when it came to, you know, again, like homecoming king and queen is embodying, right, the American beauty ideals, behaviors, um, whether Jews attempted to gain the title and didn't win or whether they decided it wasn't even worth their time trying, um, I don't totally know. Um, I would say, though, that another interesting place, though, that you see some tension and cooperation is within different Jewish groups on campus in that oftentimes Jewish fraternities and sororities relied upon partnering with the Hillel to form um, chapters of their organizations on campuses. The rabbi would sometimes point out like, oh, these are the best kids on campus. Like, this is who you want if you're going to recruit. Um, other times they found it really annoying that um, the Hillel rabbi or Hillel leaders would tell them to come to services and they didn't want to go to services. They wanted to have a social event. Um, so there were really interesting intra-Jewish dynamics at play at many of the college chapters. Um, same with like menorah societies, which tend to go a little bit out of vogue by the 1940s on a lot of college campuses. Um, so like there are a lot of different avenues for Jewish um, students to become involved in different places on college campuses. It's really the Greek system and maybe the homecoming court that are the most barred to them. Interesting. So we do have another question just to follow up on that about um, about whether, well, the, the way the question is phrased is other than having Jewish members and having events with Jewish fraternities, was there anything Jewish about these sororities? So Hanukkah parties, um, seders, kosher style food. And it's sort of a question about the relationship with religion. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you, you know, I think you've more or less answered that they were primarily social and identity based, but, but do you want to get into a little bit more how the, how the intersection with religion happened? Sure. So I would say, interestingly, it's a mixed bag in that one of the sororities in the 1950s actually broadly proclaimed in their publication that they were really proud of themselves for not appearing Jewish in terms of ritual observance. Um, chapters that had residences um, followed kind of like loose kosher style, but not all did. A couple of them served pork products, um, certainly mixed milk and meat. So um, as far as like, would a traditional, like a traditionally observant Jewish student find it easy to be in a Midwestern or Southern or even West Coast sorority chapter? Not so sure. Um, it was primarily Jewish women from reform or conservative backgrounds who really found a place in Jewish sororities. Um, although interestingly, if you look at their publications, and again, we have to sort of question like these publications are read by alumni. So like, is it for their parents? Is it for like the other adult members? Um, they'll talk about lighting Shabbat candles sometimes. They will definitely talk about their Hillel involvement, which you could see as either social, but also like religious. Like they attend Jewish studies lectures in the post-war period about a variety of topics like the history of Hanukkah. Um, so I would say the big place that I have seen Jewishness in a different manifestation is actually in their philanthropy. In that early on, I think as early as 1926, Alpha Epsilon Phi, a year after Hebrew University opens, um, creates a drive to raise money for books to send over there. And they're really proud of this form of Zionism um, and that they really feel like they're in a unique position as a Jewish group to do something for what they're hoping to be an emerging Jewish nation. Um, we also see other Jewish sororities, including these non-sectarian Jewish sororities, raising money for both um, civil, you know, civic causes that have nothing to do with religion, but oftentimes Jewish causes on the side. Certainly after World War II helping refugees. There's also a robust um, refugee program in the 1930s that AEFI does to help um, German Jewish female refugees who make it to the United States go to um, chapters of their houses and gain admission into universities that they help underwrite. Um, so I'd say that like Jewishness for most members on a group level does not mean the lived religious experience, though as individuals, many of them engage in Jewish life outside of the sorority as well. And again, the idea that almost all of them throughout this period are also dating and marrying Jewish meant something to them. So switching gears a little bit um, to think about the history of Jewish inclusion in the Greek world against a backdrop of wider changes in the 20th century I wonder if you could speak to 
comparing the Jewish experience with, for example, the black sorority fraternity experience or that of other minorities? Do they follow a parallel path where they're also African-American fraternities and sororities in the same era experiencing the same kinds of exclusion or what differences would you point out? It's a great question um, and a really difficult, interesting one to answer in that, um, I guess, very briefly, a couple of things. One is that um, African-American fraternities and sororities were actually founded at the same time as the Jewish fraternities and sororities, so really that first decade or so of the 20th century. And there, too, it's very much reflective of the fact that there is a generation of African-Americans who are attending universities in um in bigger numbers than before. And interestingly, um, with one asterisk that I'll get into in a minute, some of them are founded in the Northeast because there is a bit more and a bit more acceptance there than certainly in Southern parts of the United States or even Western parts of the United States at that time. So they do follow in an interesting way some of the Jewish story and sort of like a Northeastern corridor and then we'll slowly start moving West. Um, although the Jewish groups absolutely move Midwest and South much earlier, but also a lot of the early Black fraternity and sorority um, organizational life is also founded at the historically Black colleges and universities, um, and Jews do not have a counterpart for that. Um, and so it's also interesting that like as the HBCUs are also, um, which again had been founded earlier, they have students on their college campuses who want to use this expression of Americanness and social acceptance and you know, sort of elite socializing on these campuses as well. Um, I would say that like, there are very few times, this is much more of a localized story that like chapters of Jewish sororities do have outreach to um, black sororities, for example, um, especially in the 1960s when civil rights are heating up. Um, they are not always positive encounters. Um, it is really tense. And again, from the Jewish perspective, they always feel like they're navigating a tightrope and that like, We'd like to be more liberal and tolerant, but if we do that, what will the non-Jewish sororities that were really desperate for approval think about us? And so they're always trying to navigate that sort of like space um, and trying to figure out how visibly they would ever want to align themselves with um, Black sorority organizations and trying to partner for various things. But by the 1960s also, it should be noted that certainly in some Northeastern campuses, Jewish sororities do have Black women as members. Amazing. Fantastic. I know we're supposed to wrap up. I want to take the liberty of, of having you for like two more minutes if, you, if you'll stay and just ask one more question, bringing us up into um, closer to the present day or even into the present day, um, even though you're a historian, but I know you do think about these things and are looking at the, the world of college campuses. And I'm curious about whether these four historically Jewish sororities are still um, operating? Are they still primarily Jewish? And and whichever ones are still in place, how are they navigating today's campus Jewish identity politics and challenges? Um, so thank you for saying that I'm a historian and that I cannot pretend to be an expert on today's college campus. Um, but I would say in a nutshell, um, so certainly for Alpha Epsilon Phi and Sigma Delta Tau, which very much still identify with their Jewish roots, they are still very much raising money for some of their philanthropic causes for Jewish organizations. Um, even going to their organizational websites, I think you'll see a very visible commitment um, to Zionism to, um, again, not that they require certain things of any of their members, but as organizations. Um, they still very much embrace their Jewish roots and see themselves as helping college students navigate their Jewish present on college campuses, including some of the issues that have been coming up post October 7th. Um, Delta Phi Epsilon and Phi Sig are still very much in operation throughout the country and a little bit into Canada. Um, and they still have chapters of their groups that are still um, I don't know about predominantly, but certainly have a visible Jewish presence in them. But a lot of their chapters that were founded after the 1960s um, were founded at campuses that did not have Jewish women really in significant numbers and are very much non-sectarian. And I think um, while a couple of their chapters might still align themselves a little more closely with Hillel or see themselves as Jewishly aligned in some way, um, their national, um, much of their national offices or work as a national sorority um, does not have anything particularly Jewish about it, although they certainly um, still, you know, claim their founders and a lot of their historical roots. Thank you. This has been truly fantastic, a fan wonderful presentation. Um, 
And I want to remind people that we do have um, two more talks in this series. One is on um, campus free speech after October 7th. So really coming right up into the present day. That's with Seagal Ben Parat from Penn. And then we do have a talk with Jerome Carabell on um, anti-Semitism and admissions to elite colleges. But in the meantime, I want to thank you, Shira Cohn, for being with us and <clears throat> presenting this fantastic work. And we can't wait to read it when it comes out in your book. Um, and thanks Steve Weitzman for organizing the series and all our staff for making this possible and all of you in the audience for being here. We will post this video on YouTube in a few days once it's ready. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>